Mark time. March. Guard. Halt. Left. Face. Carry. Color. Present. Color. Say our pledge together. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Who's joining us singing the national anthem? Oh, say can you see by the dawn early light, what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous flight, or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the Might be seated. Good evening. I'm Pat Tyree, president of the Row Chapter of the Delta Kappa Gamma Society. And um, I'd like to welcome you all for being here today. Um, we appreciate your efforts to get out. I know there's a lot of dedicated citizens and um, state individuals, educators who are all here on their own time, and we certainly do appreciate that. We are um, continuing our tradition of offering this, the 11th Legislative Forum, the opportunity for opening lines of communication among our distinguished representatives, state education leaders, educators of Franklin Special School District and Williamson County Schools, and interested citizens of the community, as well as members of the media. The Delta Kappa Gamma Society International is a nonpartisan organization of educators with seven purposes, two of which will be addressed in our meeting today. To endorse and support desirable <coughs> legislation or other suitable endeavors in the interest of education, and to inform educators of current economic, social, political, and educational issues so that they may participate effectively in a world society. We have some special thank yous to go out to um, the administrators and building lead management team of Liberty Elementary. We have been able to use their building for this purpose since 2003. Um, we just um, benefited from the participation of the Franklin High School Honor Guard and um, appreciate their willingness to come out and volunteer for this too. Thank you to all the educators and administrators, central office staff of both FSSD and Williams County Schools who are attending today. We appreciate um, 
our leaders in our row chapter who have coordinated this event. Judy Jackson has invited our guests and she facilitated the um, communication among the Franklin Special School District educators. Dr. Sandra Juarez in Williamson County was her counterpart on that. Dr. K. A. Walt Musgrove, um, of Roche, a member of Roe Chapter, has been the forum moderator for each one of these legislative forums. And we appreciate her efforts in compiling the topics and issues that have been submitted by our community. And um, I'm going to turn our attention over to Judy Jackson, who will introduce our distinguished guests. Thank you, Madam President. I'm Judy Fox Jackson. Um, I taught 25 years at Liberty here in first grade, I just uh, 25 of my 40 years in education. I just retired this past May from full-time teaching, but I didn't retire from education. Um, I underscore uh, Pat's welcome and, and appreciation for all of you being here today. There's all kinds of activities going on with teachers, tutoring, training, uh, teachers in meetings, so you'll see some coming and going. We appreciate having Dr. Snowden with us today, our director of schools from uh, Franklin Special. And uh, if you're an administrator, a uh, school board member from either Franklin Special or Williamson County, would you please stand and let us recognize you? And Dr. Snowden, you are. We thank you for your leadership and for being here today. If you're a teacher in either of our systems or in any other system, would you please stand? And we appreciate the leadership that you give every day, every year, throughout the time. Um, Cable Channel 3, we want to thank you for making this a, a possibility that the, the community will be able to see this at a later time. Um, if I shared all the biographical material about our distinguished uh, panelists and, and our moderator today, there would be a, no more time left for anything else. And we have received many questions in advance. We'll hope if there's time for questions from the floor, we'll hope to cover that. But Dr. Awalt will talk about that with protocol in just a little bit. Um, as we start our introductions, and, and I'll be, I said, brief and hope to do justice to all of them. Ms. Emily Barton comes to us. She's the Assistant Commissioner of Curriculum and Instruction for the Tennessee Department of Education. In this position, she oversees Tennessee's transition to Common Core State Standards, including assessment design, instructional materials, and educator training and support, as well as Tennessee's work with educator evaluation. Prior to this role, she served as Chief of Staff for Commissioner Kevin Huffman, supporting the development of the Department of Education's strategic plan. For five years prior to coming to Tennessee, uh, Ms. Barton managed Teach for America's DC region and she launched the organization's work in Connecticut. She started her career in education teaching seventh grade in Louisiana. Um, Senator Jack Johnson, and we're glad you're here and we knew you were gonna be a little bit late and glad everything is, is okay. He represents the 23rd State Senate District of Tennessee. He has served in our state Senate since 2006. He has served and continues to serve as a member of many Senate committees. I can't, can't begin to mention all of them for any of our group. He chairs, I believe, the Commerce, Labor, and Agriculture Committee, still to do that. He is a senior vice president and financial advisor um, by occupation. He graduated from Texas State University with a Bachelor of Science degree in education. He's very involved with activities of his three children and with his family, and we welcome you again. Representative Glenn Cassida was recently re-elected to the House. He has served as representative in the House since 2001, uh, representing the 63rd District. He has served and, again, currently serves as a member of many House committees and chairs the Health and Human Resources Committee. Uh, his occupation is in sales. His uh, degree is from Western Kentucky University in Agriculture and Education, and a very proud grandfather and father of four. We welcome, for his first time, to our legislative forum, Representative-elect Jeremy Durham, um, having been newly elected to serve the newly created 65th District. He will be receiving House Committee assignments when session begins January 13. He is an attorney serving clients in many areas with particular emphasis regarding small business law. He's a graduate of the University of Tennessee and of Memphis Law School and he and his wife reside here in Franklin. Representative Charles Sargent 
Also recently re-elected to the House, representing the 61st District, has served in the General Assembly for Tennessee since 1996, has also been a member of, of many House committees and continues to serve on many House committees. He chairs the Finance, Ways, and Means Committee. He is an insurance agent. He attended Pace University in New York and served in the U.S. Navy. He's a very proud and active father of three and also a grandfather. Dr. K. A. Watt Musgrove, our very faithful moderator for our legislative forums, as Pat mentioned, since 2003, a very involved member of Roe Chapter. She retired from the Franklin Special School District, having served as primary teacher, assistant principal, principal, associate director of teaching and learning. In her retirement, she serves as advanced ed field consultant with SACS and as Tennessee ASCD executive secretary, among many other educational activities. She holds degrees from Texas Wesleyan College, from Baylor, and from Peabody College of Vanderbilt. She's a very proud uh, mom and grandmother of twins, and we welcome her husband, Bob, this afternoon, and her, Pat, her colleague, uh, Ms. Pat Ashcraft. Um, doctor, as you see, there was no way I could share all of the accomplishments and experiences of our, our group, as, among other civic and community activities that they do. Um, so I just shared the tip of the iceberg with you. To all of you, thank you for making this a, a special time on your calendar and for always being faithful to be here, and for the, some for the first time. So Dr. A. Walt Musgrove will give protocol for the rest of our meeting today. <laughs> thank you. Um, we have two new people, so I, I will tell you that I've I threatened mm -hmm. to ring my bell, and I haven't been able to do it yet. So we're going to give each person one minute, and that's where I can ring the bell. And I would love to ring the bell. I'd love to ring the bell on Charles Sargent or Glenn Cassida. <laughs> uh, so each one will have one minute to kind of give you a feel for where they're going and what's going on, and then we have uh, questions that w we will pose to each one of you. I guess we'll start with you. I'm trying to get my timer ready so I can <laughs> be within time, yes. Go. Go. Um, okay, so uh, just opening remarks, not responding right. to a question. Right. Great. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Emily Barton. Um, I have been working at the Tennessee Department of Education for a year and a half and very proudly serving the work of education in Tennessee. Um, I oversee our work on Common Core State Standards tra Transition, but um, I have also worked on teacher evaluation fairly extensively. I think we have a couple of core coaches in the audience. Um, we trained 13,000 teachers this past summer as we begin implementation of Common Core State Standards, and it's been a real privilege to work alongside teachers and leaders in Tennessee as we make that transition. Um, I'm thrilled to be here and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, if it makes you feel better, when I was in school, the bell was rung on me quite a bit. So. <laughs> You're <laughs> I look, I look uh, forward to this every year. Thank you guys for putting this together and Judy and Kay and the leadership. Uh, my understanding is this is one of the few things actually done across the state and across this nation. It's a model that I wish every school district would do because this is the, the basics of, of government and your government is interacting with us. The, uh, the legislature, both Senate and House, has super majorities for the Republicans, first time since the 60s, uh, 1967 to be exact. And so the governor, I know, is talking and thinking a lot of education reform as well as the department. And we look forward to working with them and trying to get something through that, that meets uh, and helps our young people excel in school. So look forward to sitting with, down with you not only today, but from this point forward. Call us, email us, and I look forward to those interactions. Thank you for having me. I know. When I was running for office, I remember, uh, I guess I knocked on Judy Jackson's door and she told me about this event and how, uh, <laughs> how informative it would be. And as someone who uh, is not an educator, someone who wanted to be educated on um, all the things that are, that are facing uh, teachers, parents, and students, uh, I wanted to be educated, and this was this one and Joe's. Uh, he actually I knocked on his door too, and he told me to go to his. But those were two of the most uh, beneficial things I got to go to when I was running for office. 
and two people in this room put them together. Um, and w actually, education is why that my wife and I chose to move to Williamson County. I grew up in Adamsville, Tennessee, which is a one red light town about two hours away from here. Um, but you guys have a, we, we have a great education system here. And I thank you all for what you do, um, all the blood, sweat, and tears that you put in our education system. That's why I'm here, and that's why I was passionate enough to, to run for office. So thank you all for having this, and thank you for what you do. Thank you. I'm, I'm Charles Sargent. Uh, enjoy every year being here because I probably learn more than I, I give as far as information. So it's always a learning experience. Jeremy does not understand yet that we're going to break him in correct and we're going to let him answer the questions first all the time. <laughs> we're not going to rotate. So, uh, no, we, we're very fortunate to have Jeremy because he's uh, very interested in education and has done, uh, been involved in some of these situations just in the last two months. A uh, number of meetings we've had with uh, Dr. Looney and uh, different teachers. So, uh, you know you're going to have his ear. I look forward to answering the questions and uh, hope we can answer them too. You know, so you can learn some, uh, some of the stuff and uh, what we know and what possibly is coming up in, the, uh, in this coming legislative session. So look forward to it. Thank you. I don't want to be the first to have the bell rung on me, so I'm going to set my stopwatch. <laughs> uh, it's great to be back with you. I'm sorry I was a few minutes late. Uh, speaking of education and, and young ones, uh, I get a call from the school nurse at Hillsborough, and my eight-year-old had fallen on the playground and busted his knee. I was in a meeting with three commissioners at the state capitol, uh, but my wife was in court and had her phone off, so I had to leave the capitol and <laughs> rush back to get my son. He's fine. He's fine. Uh, maybe a little bit dramatic, but uh, it's great to be. I'm sure y'all can't relate to that at all. <clears throat> it's great to be with you. It's great to have Jeremy joining us. He's going to be a great member of our delegation. Uh, there's a lot going on in education, and if, if there's one thing I, I would like to say in my brief opening remarks, it is that the <clears throat> importance of the communication between you, of all, you all who have boots on the ground and those of us who are up at the Capitol uh, making decisions and policy has never been more important, and uh, that will continue to be the case over the next, uh, next few months. So thank you for your taking time to be here, and, and please know that we all have an open door. Thank you. Great. Don't they do well on that part? <laughs> uh, just a reminder, we do have a number of questions, and we have always promised everyone that we'll try our best to be through in an hour. So if we do not have time for questions from the floor, uh, I think there are cards around. You can write your question on a card. Judy will see that it gets to the correct person, and then we'll make sure that it gets back to you. So make sure if you do that, you give us a name or an email or something that we can get back with you. Um, I'll have to say, they do have the questions except for one. I had one come in late uh, for Ms. Barton, and I'll read that one. But I've sometimes rearranged the questions to try to get them all in sync, so it may not follow exactly the way you have it. This question will start off for Ms. Barton, and they did not receive this. We understand that there are some individuals that are now with the Department of Education working with the team evaluation and focus schools across the state. Could you clarify what they are doing and what their job description is? Mm -hmm. Um, sure. So I don't know the specific bullets of their job description. Um, I stopped personally managing evaluation about six months ago. But um, we have hired at the department five individuals who work as um, team supporters for districts um, and, excuse me, for schools that are focus schools and also exhibited um, a, a disconnect between the distribution on the team rubric and the distribution on the value added rubric. So these are not, um, not evaluators of any kind. They're not coming in to do additional evaluations. They're there to help the school as they look to use the evaluation process to strengthen student learning. Um, so they are supports to the school in that process. Okay, thank you. Now this first question, you know, 
educators are wonderful. We always have to give a little history and background before we ask a question. And I've got a couple of pages of background. <laughs> they have received it, but I think the audience deserves to hear the background, so I, I will read it. In recent years, there have been significant reductions in cuts that affect fine arts education and professional development in Tennessee schools. Among them, the position within the State Department of Education which supervised and coordinated fine arts curriculum and instruction was eliminated. This happened after the position had already been given added responsibilities for, for world language curriculum and instruction. Today, there is no one in the DOE to facilitate fine arts instruction in the state of Tennessee. All state funding for the Tennessee Arts Academy, a nationally recognized professional development program for fine art teachers held at Belmont University for the past 26 years, was eliminated for the upcoming 2013 Academy. Approximately 275 Tennessee arts teachers attended this event annually and consider it the finest professional development experience available to them anywhere in the nation. These teachers impact approximately 100,000 Tennessee students each year. 32 students, 32 teachers from Franklin and Williamson County, over 12% of total participants attended the Art Academy last year, impacting more, most students in the Franklin Special School District and Williamson County schools. Most recently, all Tennessee governor schools were issued a 26% budget cut. This included the School for the Arts. To implement this cut, the banned portion of the Governor's School of the Arts was eliminated entirely, and the number of students in orchestra and choral music, visual arts, drama, and dance was significantly reduced as well. Indirect consequences of the current education environment, which emphasize standardized testing, has led to reductions in fine art program, classes, teachers, instructional time, and more in most schools in Tennessee. We hear often that 21st century skills are key to student success in the future. The use of creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, decision making, communication skills, and collaboration are naturally present and developed in the fine arts classes. Without quality fine arts opportunities, Tennessee students will continue to fall behind their peers across the country. Question. <laughs> Took a lot to get to the question. What steps would you take to include dedicated supervisory position in the State Department of Education to oversee the day-to-day -day operations and continued improvement of the fine arts program in Tennessee schools? That's a budget question. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is what they do. I'm going to start doing it to everyone else. Um, we're going to look at restoring uh, the funding for these programs in 2013. The governor's school has maintained the funding at a lower level at the present time, and they are able to, with the money they have, still run the governor's uh, program. Uh, last year, you know, we, we went through some budget cuts. We had some money left over. This year, we have the money left over from last year, so I think you'll see some of this uh, programming being refunded uh, and restored into the BEP uh, as far as that's concerned. So, but the governor's program, the, uh, the governor's school is still there at reduced funding, but it's still functioning. And uh, I think you'll see continuing funding on that and probably increased funding uh, when it comes to that. Did you have anything? Um, sure, my, given that I oversee curriculum and instruction, I think, Fine arts is so important, and I think that there are many subjects that are incredibly important that don't have a dedicated staff member at the Department of Education, in part because we, we don't run schools. So day-to-day -day operations is not something that we're overseeing in math or reading, um, and, and that is also true in fine arts. But um, I think there's some very innovative work that is going on in the fine arts community. I, I would really commend Drew Davidson in Memphis 
who started a committee with other educators from across the state to create an alternate rubric that can be used to support student learning in the arts. And um, that rubric was approved by the State Board of Education and is being used in some districts as part of the team <coughs> evaluation model. Um, I think that's a great example of real innovation and leadership among educators coming together. The, there are so many subjects that are important and that they are not tested does not make them not important. Um, but we do need to assess the skills that are, are most linked to what employers really need in, a, in an educated workforce. Okay, I, I think um, you answered the second question, but I'll ask it again and see if there's anyone. What are your plans to restore funding for the Tennessee Arts Academy and the Tennessee Governor Schools? And I think, Representative Sargent, you... you. Correct. The, the other thing I want to say on the arts, the arts come in all different shape, form, and fashion. But uh, just recently, uh, all of us sent out to every school here in Williams County and in Franklin Special, a brochure on the uh, Traveling Arts Show. And what this is, it's from the uh, Tennessee State Museum. And they have a trunk show. And I don't know if any, you know, for some reason this word's not getting out to the teachers. Uh, and you can order this trunk show from the Tennessee State Museum and they'll ship it out to you. And it will have all different, I mean, there's a number of trunks they, uh, from grades three to eight, K to five, you know, eight to 12, and uh, it's the life and times of the you know, first Tennessean, daily life on the uh, Tennessee frontier, uh, and it, all, a little bit of everything. And the State Museum will send this out to you. There's one uh, that, the one I, I think is fascinating, is a large map of Tennessee they have. And it's really a carpet, and they lay it out. It's about 18, 20 feet long, about five feet wide and they teach different parts of Tennessee history as far as agriculture, like cotton grown over in Memphis, and then they, they give you all the instructional materials in it. And I like to see teachers you know, become more familiar with it. I think it'd be a, a great, uh, another avenue to see something different than just a textbook and everything on that nature. And all the equipment comes, comes with it, and I'm gonna leave some We'll leave some brochures, uh, brochures here with, with you, but every principal has gotten a, a letter talking about this, and you know they have a brochure and everything else in the uh, principal's office. So that's just one more part of art when we're looking at art in different forms and fashion. The third question on this, and, and I don't know if you want to add to, what are your thoughts as to how fine arts instruction as a part of education education, the whole child, leads to better instructional outcomes for students overall. Anyone want to add to that? I'll, I'll be glad to, to, to chime in. <clears throat> I think it's a critical part, and I mean, the studies have, have shown that, that the kids that are exposed to music and drama and, and, and various types of fine arts are <clears throat> do better in, in school. And <clears throat> Excuse me. I I was raised to play music with my dad, and, and I mean, music has always been such a critical part of my life and a, and a very rewarding part of my life. And you know, we're trying to pass that on to our kids. <clears throat> I want to echo what Chairman Sargent said, because a lot of the questions, rightfully so, have to do with funding, and and we talk about this, you know, every year. We face several challenges as a state. Number one, we're not like Washington, D.C. We can't print money. We can't run a deficit. Um, and we have to actually balance our budget, honestly balance it, year in and year out. And we've done that. And with the economic collapse in 2008, we've had to make some very difficult choices. <clears throat> Fortunately, the general consensus within the General Assembly has been to try to leave education alone. And largely, we've done that and, and tried to preserve our, our BEP funding uh, because there's just such a strong commitment to education. The second challenge, we talk about this every year, but it bears repeating, that we face in Williamson County, with Williamson County and Franklin Special Schools, is this notion that we're so rich down here, we don't need any money. And, and we get penalized under the current BEP formula. I say penalized. Well, I, I, maybe better stated is we don't get our adequate fair share of dollars, as far as I'm concerned, to account for things like growth. <clears throat> because, you know, even though our county population may be rather static, 
our student population is growing because people who've lost their jobs can no longer afford private schools. Uh, people that were formerly homeschooling are putting their kids in. So our student population continues to grow at a similar rate as it did prior to the economic downturn. And yet we're not realizing you know, any, any funding. So I'm, I'm grateful to Franklin Special and certainly grateful to the Williamson County Commission for really stepping up to the plate and, and providing some of that extra funding. The final thing I want to say relative to this whole funding picture, and I really salute Charles and, and <clears throat> Glenn and, 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 and our finance leadership team in the Senate, because one of the biggest things we hang, have hanging over us, and this is not a discussion about this, but it's important to note, is Obamacare. And <clears throat> as passed, Obamacare was set to cost our state an additional two to three hundred million dollars. And I think that our, our finance leadership under Charles's guidance in the House was very prudent to set aside money uh, for that uh, anticipated expense. Now, the Supreme Court overturned the Medicaid expansion portion of Obamacare, which was going to probably be the biggest direct spending impact. And that's good news, because if we choose, and that decision hasn't been made, but if we choose not to expand Medicaid, then we'll have some additional resources. And getting back to the question is, with regards to fine arts and, and, and many other aspects of education, there, there are some areas that, that, because Tennessee is such a well-run state financially, we'll have some revenues, and our economy is, knock on wood, expanding and growing, and our tax revenues are, are, are expanding, and so we can start to look at some of those critical areas to restore funding. And certainly, with regards to education, fine arts will be, will be on that list. Thank you. We have another funding question. This year, extended contract funding was reduced. With our race to the top focus on improving student achievement and performance, a reduction in funding seems counter to our mission. Question, what caused the funding to be reduced? The, the extended contract funding, if you go back, it was all under career ladder. And most teachers are no longer, they're retiring that we're getting their funding. Even if we kept the same funding, it would not mean that new teachers would be provided that money, because that was all dedicated to career ladder. And as you know, that was a program back in the 80s, 86, 87, uh, Governor Lamar Alexander, now Senator Lamar Alexander started that program. So there's no new people coming into the program. There hasn't been new people coming into Korea Ladder probably for the last 15 years. So those people that were in there are now retiring. So as they retire, that funding continues to drop every year. If it didn't, the money wouldn't just go to be spread out between all the teachers because they were dedicated to those in the Korea Ladder uh, Association. So. You know, unless you were in career ladder, if you're in career ladder now, you're still getting that funding. That's why it's dropping. It's just because of the retirement of the teachers. It's not that we don't like the program or anything of that nature, but there are no more going into the uh, career ladder situation. I'm going to put the next two questions together because it's related to that. What, if any, measures are being taken by our elected, elected officials to replace or restore those funds? and what are your suggestions that we do as concerned educators to appeal to the decision makers to reinstate extended contract, extended contract funding to a high level? Well, you probably know better than I because you were probably an extended, you know, a number of people probably extended contract teachers and that's no longer in existence. So we, you know, there's nothing we can do under the extended contracts. I mean, is there another fund or a source? I, I think this question is asking another fund or source or something. That was a dedicated uh, amount of money. Uh, so there's not, it just gets folded back in. When we reduce that, it gets folded back into the total overall BEP funding. Because that was a very dedicated you know, group of funding. I mean, four years ago, that money was about $32 million, and you can see now it's down to about $10 million. And probably in the next three or four years, it will be down to a couple of million dollars. And that was just strictly dedicated to those teachers that were career ladder one, two, or three. And so we don't have that category or classification anymore. I mean, I'm Anyone want to? Okay. It is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> if the purpose of education is to create productive members of society, why are we insisting that all Tennessee students take chemistry or physics? 
Wouldn't some students benefit more from additional vocational classes to teach a skill or a trade than forcing subjects upon them that they do not have the skills, nor do they desire the skills to be successful? Since I haven't answered a question, I guess I'll jump in on that one. <laughs> I, I, I can't defend or, or, uh, or, or uh, accept the premise. I can just parrot, if you will, what I think the Department of Education would say. But I hope, uh, I hope you'll back in. And, and But I think the goal is to create individuals that are more, more well-rounded. Uh, we talked earlier about the arts. Uh, that makes a person more well-rounded. When you enter into the job market, either after college or after high school, uh, Chemistry and those types of curriculum teach analytical thinking, uh, and it makes you more able to tackle the requirements, maybe not chemistry directly, maybe not geometry directly, but it teaches you to think and think critically and, and, be, and offer more as you enter into the job market. Now, if I'm way off base, correct me. <laughs> Emily? No, you're, I mean, science is a required component of public education according to federal law. And that goes all the way through high school, and that is because science is critical to a functioning society and to strong analytic thinking. Um, I, I think the premise of this question, CTE is a major priority for this administration, and we believe very strongly in the importance of strong career and technical education. The, the thing that we are focused on is making sure that the completion of a CTE program leads to skills that are viable in this market, and that we don't have an imbalance between the percent of people who are completing a CTE program and they think they're going to end that and be viable for jobs, and then they get out into the workforce and there's just not jobs in that, in that area. And we are also focused on making sure that we're we're, th this is at the heart of my work with Common Core state standards. We're focusing on the skills that are actually required by employers. So right now in Tennessee, we're in a, a really exciting position, and I echo the comments about our expanding economy, but there are a number of businesses that are thinking about expanding in Tennessee or looking to relocate to Tennessee. And the thing that is holding them back is they are worried about whether they are going to find the skilled workers to take the jobs. We've heard plant managers say that they're going to Kentucky to recruit workers because they cannot find individuals in Tennessee with the basic math and reading skills required to be trained for living wage jobs. And that's not a situation any of us want. We don't think that the, the students in Tennessee are less talented than the students in, in Kentucky. We don't think the parents in Tennessee care less than the parents in Kentucky. We want to focus on making sure that we are delivering a high quality education that covers all of the required bases to be a well-rounded citizen and doing so at a high level. Yeah, and, and let me echo, add on to that. Businesses have stressed that these children coming out of schools need to have these skill sets to succeed. I mean, math and physics, you know, you're saying sometimes, I was watching a show the other day uh, on manufacturing, and they made little pieces, they made a number of pieces for the uh, airline industry, and they very had to be very precise and, you know, to the like one thousandth of a degree, and how to do this, and how to use the computers on these machines, and how just simple math things that we, we take for granted that our children need to have these skills to get employment. I mean, right here in Middle Tennessee, we have about five to 6,000 IT, especially medical IT positions open. We don't have some of the, the, the qualified individuals to fill these jobs. So businesses are driving what our universities, even our high schools, have to teach because they know what the workforce is needed, what workforce they need to be successful and to make their employees successful. And they're sending them to technology schools and, and things of that nature. And they're, a lot of businesses are paying it to train these people. And that's, businesses have really stressed the, you know, the importance of making sure these children have the math and the sciences. Uh, so, and, that, and that's where it's, a lot of it's being pushed from 
what businesses are saying they need in the workforce. We have a couple of other questions, and you may have already answered, but I'm going to go ahead and read it. When we compare students in the United States to those of countries whose education is considered the best in the world, those countries have a two-path education system. Those countries realize that not every child is geared toward the academic rigor needed for college entry and success. Therefore, they provide the opportunity to learn skills and trades that will benefit society. And there are two questions with that. If we in the state of Tennessee want to be competitive on a global market, why are we missing the boat on teaching vocational classes and setting our own students up for academic failure with the potential of increasing our dropout rate? And there's a parenthesis. Note that automobile mechanics, plumbers, electricians, machinists, brick masons have very lucrative jobs. And the second question, has the state had any discussion regarding vocational high schools for students not headed to college? And I don't know whether you want to add to that. You've already said a lot. Well, I don't think there's such a thing as a shade tree mechanic anymore. Mm -hmm. I have a new Jeep out there and I define a mechanic of 40 years ago to go in and do any work in that car. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's totally computerized. I mean, it, and these are, the, you know, these are the things that we have to go back and understand where we're coming from and where the industry is coming from. I mean, I'll tell you how bad this car is, or good. Uh, I had to jump my wife's car off. I opened the hood up. And I looked, there's no battery. And I said, even I know there's a battery for a car. And I look, and I'm looking in the engine compartment, there's no battery. So I had to get the book out to find out where the battery was in the car. I mean, everything is computerized in my car. I had to bring it back in. And everything that happens to the car is read out on a computer. So they hooked the computer up, and they can tell me exactly what was going on with the car and why it was happening. So have a mechanic you know, just changing the spark plug, you don't do that anymore. And I mean, all this stuff is so technical that, you know, you have to have some of these skills. And I'm, you know. Uh, I'm hearing you saying physics is an important part. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, it, these are all so important. I'm just bringing back, and this is what the businesses are saying, what they need in the workforce. They, they need trained people, because I don't think the average mechanic could work on a car today. I mean, you know, a mechanic of 40 years ago, I'm not saying the average mechanic, but, and they have to have a complete different set of job skills than they did 30 or 40 years ago, uh, as far as that's concerned. Okay, I'm gonna move to, do you have something? Move to a different subject. Isn't the funding of charter schools just another mm -hmm. way to put public funds for private schools? I'll go where no man I, dares. I would, I, would, I, would, I would look to Jeremy to answer that. <laughs> no, I think I think what we're going to see with charter schools is um, for those systems that are failing. Uh, I think there is a desire to figure out how to rescue those children. Uh, we don't want our children or any children going to a school or a school system uh, that's failing. Uh, I, I support vouchers for failing for children in failing systems. And I think that's important. And so I think that's where you're going to see a, the debate in the state of Tennessee this next year is on that topic. What do we do for systems that are failing? How do we help those children? And how do we rescue them? OK, the next question talks Can about I just that. Clarify oh, yes, one sure. thing. So charter schools are public schools. They are not private schools. Um, and I, I think that's a, just an important component of this. The success record for charter schools is not strong. And there was a lot in the paper today about that, as many of them do not show marked change toward improvement. However, if they were, were to be found effective, why not then allow public schools the same freedom in teaching with regards to creativity and a lack of standardized testing? And I, I would, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly, and then I'll pass it on, but I would, I would agree with that, with the last statement first. Yeah, I would say uh, as a former that. principal, mm -hmm. I kind of took some yeah. freedom. Yeah, we need to. Uh, that that's is how you become innovative is freedom, 
And uh, my goodness, I work for a, a large company, and that's the one thing we don't have is freedom. It's so become so bureaucratic that our our uh, ability to think outside the box and solve problems is gone. And I see that happening to a lot of public schools. So with that said, I, I think that's something we need to look at. Um, but on the first case, some charter schools do do very well, and some don't. And so those that don't, just like if you read the Tennessean today, uh, the one that's not doing well uh, is going to lose its charter. Uh, but those that are doing well, we want them to stay in, we want them to stay and continue to perform. What I was going to say is if you're a charter school and you don't perform well, you get shut down, just like Glenn said. Um, I'm probably not going to be out front on a charter school bill because we have great public schools in Williamson County. I don't think that it's a top five or a top ten issue here. I am sensitive, though, if there's, you know, a, a a Mem an inner city Memphis um, lady who can't afford to send her child to a private school and she's trapped in a public school, I would, I really hope that we can find some solution that would fit her situation. Uh, those are the types of uh, situations that the legislators are looking at. I don't know that any bill that I've heard discussed, and one of my good friends is probably going to carry the voucher bill, would apply to Williamson County. I sincerely doubt that it would. I think you're going to see that apply to Nashville and Memphis. Charter schools um, trade increased accountability for results for freedom. And if they don't perform, they get shut down. That's the premise of the model. But charter schools still take standardized tests and actually are accountable for higher results on those standardized tests. So the only thing I'd clarify in this question is there are no charter schools that are exempt from standardized testing. Um, they're actually on the hook more so, so that they will produce results because if they don't, then the model is they should get shut down. Some more questions on that. Why is our state trying to take funds from public schools and use them to fund charter in private schools? Is this not a conflict of the separation of church and state? Do you support the use of vouchers at religious schools? If yes, why wouldn't separation of church and state prevent the use of public money in this way? This is just a, this is just a legal point. It's not necessarily answering the question, but... I mean, separation of church and state is not in the Constitution. That was Thomas Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptist. Um, a lot of people feel very strongly that parents should have a whole lot of control over how their children are educated. And if they want to use those for a private school, that's what they should be able to do. Personally, I'm going to listen to the parents, teachers, and people who know, know a lot more than me before I make a decision like that. But that's what the other side says. I think that's the question that y'all are asking. But that's... That's where the other side is coming from. That would be their response. Well, and there is no voucher legislation yet. And we, we're talking about it, but we really do not understand exactly what's going to come out, if anything is going to come out, uh, on, on vouchers. If vouchers do go to a private or to a religious school, that money by federal law cannot be used to teach a religious class. So, I mean, that's prohibited by federal law, and state law will follow, follow the same exact thing. So, if you had a Bible study, that class would be exempt. You could not fund that with, uh, with state money. I mean, that under federal law at the present time, and I, I can't see us changing that. Uh, vouchers are talked about for some of the lower performing districts in the state, and we'll use Memphis or we can use uh, Davidson County. In Williams County, we got to be very careful when we talk about vouchers for the simple reason that vouchers work maybe in other states, but in other states, they are most of the time education is funded by the state, 90 percent funded by the state. In Tennessee, local tax dollars fund, at least here in Williams County, it funds 55 percent of the total bill. So when we look at, it's one thing saying we're going to follow, let the state dollars follow the student, but then dictating what the county does with their, their money it has to be totally, has to be totally different. And this is, uh, I've been in a couple of meetings on this. And a lot of the outside organizations looking at vouchers do not understand how we're funded 
basically different than what a lot of the schools throughout the country are set up, because uh, we rely so much on local dollars as far as that's concerned. So there, there could be a thing that the state money follows the student, but the local dollars does not. In this, on the vouchers, they're talking about coming across county lines even, open up county lines. Well, that's not going to work in Tennessee. Now, I, I got the expert on Board of Education, but if you can imagine if we opened up, we didn't have county lines, how many people from Davidson County do you think would be coming to Williams County Schools? Okay? Williamson County cannot afford to build because the state doesn't pay any money for the bricks and mortar in this building or any other building in Williamson County. So you, you've got to be very careful when you start looking at vouchers and how this money is going to follow the student. State money may be able to, but when you get into local funding, you've got to be very careful that local dollars go somewhere else may not even go, local dollars may not even go into Williamson County. So vouchers is going to be a, a very, if a bill comes out, and I think there will be a bill, but no one has seen anything on it yet. Uh, I think a number of people are working on it. I think the administration is working on it, but we have to be very careful when we just say, I'm for a voucher uh, as, as far as that's concerned, because Right here at Williamson County, we probably have about 10,000 students that are in private schools at one shape, form, or fashion. And if we exited 10,000 students out of our school system, you know, there's no way we'd have empty buildings and things of that nature. So this has to be a very fine balancing act. And uh, Dr. Snowden and I just this evening were talking about it before the uh, before we start this forum tonight. And uh, so uh, they're trying to do it in the inner city schools. And even on that, I don't know if it's going to work with using local dollars. Uh, it's easy to say, and we always want to, you know, say give more money to Memphis or give more money to such and such a place. And after a while, we still haven't shown the results in these areas that we keep on throwing additional dollars to and the performance has not changed over the years whatsoever. <coughs> but the performance in Williamson County has increased every single year. We got some of the top, both the county and Franklin Special School District. We all saw a chart on this two weeks ago when we had a meeting, how far up we are compared to the other school districts. And I mean, you know, that's why Williamson County and Franklin Special are the top school districts along with Maryville and our cohort and things like that, the top school districts in the state. So we got to be real careful on the uh, voucher system. It's easy to say I want all this money to go, but it always doesn't work the same way. I've got two questions that I'm going to combine because they're on vouchers, and you may have already answered most of it, but I want the audience to hear the question, and you can add to it. Uh, if you want to. Last year there was a proposal that vouchers be offered to families whose children qualified for free or reduced lunch. It seems that the tuition cost left after using the voucher would still be too high for these families. Was there any research done to determine how many private schools would have been affordable for these families if they had received voucher? If schools were found to be affordable, did they have accreditation necessary so that these students could transfer back to public schools without having to undergo testing by the public school first if they choose to do so? And the second question, often the argument for use of vouchers is to give the parents more choices for their children if they are zoned for a school that is not showing ample growth of its students based on standardized testing. Test. If a school accepts vouchers, do you believe they should have to prove student growth on standardized tests? If yes, what requ requirements will be put in place? If no, why not? Well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll start, and I'm not sure I can remember all elements of that question. Uh, I'll do my best. Um, the, the bill that was passed last year, and it actually was passed in the Senate, but I don't think it passed in the House, two things. It was for failing districts only, and I believe it was only in the four large counties only for failing schools within those four large counties, and it was means tested. Um, and, and it was basically a pilot program is, is effectively what it was, because it was very narrow in scope. 
<clears throat> it was a good topic of conversation. It did not pass the House, so it didn't, didn't go anywhere. Um, one thing I wanted to add to the previous discussion is that the governor has formed an Opportunity Scholarship Task Force that is meeting and being directed by the Commissioner of, of Education and uh, Commissioner Huffman. And, and I've sat in on a couple of those meetings where they're talking about it. And, and Charles hit the nail on the head. It's very complicated. It's very, it's, there's a lot of moving pieces and parts about where the money goes, where the money comes from, who gets to use it. And one of the questions asked, and, and it is a, a dilemma, uh, the, the bill that was passed by the Senate, and it did not pass the House, just simply said one half of the money allotted. And in some areas, that would be roughly the, the state portion. And in some districts, the state portion is 70, 80 percent. Uh, and, and others, like Williamson County, the state portion is less than the county portion that, that, that is put in, or, and with Franklin Special. But that, that bill just simply said that half the money could follow the student. Now, in Memphis, in inner city Memphis, uh, or in the Memphis City School System, it's what, 12, 13,000 per student? At, at thereabouts is it's so if you took half of that money and and yes there were schools there were private schools that that would come pretty close to funding tuition uh, in some schools they have scholarships that we could supplement that in some cases there, there are private entities private endowments and so forth that could chip in and contribute some of that too the bottom line is <clears throat> even with that pilot program which I did vote for it would have created an opportunity, not for all kids in these failing schools, but for some of them at least to get out and, and, and get into a, a different school to try, try something else. Um, that uh, scenario is being discussed within the governor's task force, a, as well as many others. Where, where do you do it? Um, you get into some constitutional issues about, you know, if you do something for certain counties but not other counties. We have this discussion uh, constantly here in Williamson County. Tennessee is 46th in the nation. 46th in the nation. We are failing our kids in this state. Not here, not in Williamson County, not in Franklin Special. So we all wear two hats. We have to improve this, and everything has to be on the table. Uh, whether it's race to the top and achievement districts, whether it's vouchers, whether it's charter schools, we have to try anything and everything. The second thing, hat that we all wear is trying to protect the great thing we have here in Williamson County. And, and because our kids here are getting a great education, and this Franklin Special and, Ten and Williamson County are not just among the top performing in the state, or the top performing in the state, they're among the top performing in the nation. And so we're trying to do what we can to, to help our colleagues that are trying to improve education in rural parts of Tennessee and some of the inner city areas where these kids are being deprived of a, a quality education. But at the same time, recognizing D Dr. Snowden, Dr. Looney, our teachers here, our school boards here, are, they're a model for the nation. So it's, it's, it's a juggling act because we've got to try to improve the state, but we want to try to Insulate may not be the right word, but, but that's the only word I can think of right now is to try to insulate the great things we have here in Williams County. Okay, we're getting uh, close to our time, and uh, there are a couple of more. I think this is an invitation. The question is, why don't legislators ever come to our schools, meet with the teachers more than a few minutes, and sit in our classrooms? I think that's an invitation to come. Mm -hmm. I'm always more than happy to come, but I just can't walk through the door and say, I want to go to second grade class. You know, we almost have to be invited. I mean, you know. Okay, and, uh, invite them. You know, I, I mean, really. I, I did mean, one time. You, you know, <laughs> and I know a number of teachers sitting out here, and you know, all they have to do is call one of us or all of us, and you know, we're more than happy to come out and to a classroom, talk about you know whatever subject matter uh, you would like. Uh, I was at a class, in fact, it wasn't even in my district, it was in Davidson County uh, about two weeks ago, and talked to, uh, they had it in the auditorium, talked to uh, third, fourth, and fifth graders. I thought I was just talking to one class, and I was surprised when I got there, and they said, well, we wanted everyone to have the advantage to be able to talk to a legislator. So we had third, fourth, and fifth grade classes, so I had about 120 students there, and it, it worked out well, and you know, uh, but you know, we just can't, I mean, I'm not going to walk in, I don't think these gentlemen will either. I mean, I walk in, I have to sign in, where are you going? <laughs> well, I'm going down to the second grade classroom. Well, why? Well, they wanted me to talk to them. 
<laughs> well, what teacher? I don't know. I, you know, it's, I, I, I'm exaggerating, but call and ask, and we're more than happy to do it. I mean, I think this applies to um, the department staff as well, and my team actually. Um, we have a goal this year of doing a thousand classroom visits because it's so important we see what's going on in classrooms, in schools, and, and there's no evaluation component of this, there's no um, stakes associated with it, but we wanna spend at least 10 minutes really watching teaching and learning in at least 1,000 classrooms across the state, so I welcome you to email me and we will, we will be there. I think I'm the only one in the delegation, at least, that has a third, fourth, and seventh grader in, in <laughs> Williamson County Schools. So I spend a good bit of time uh, uh, involved with my kids' uh, uh, school activities. My wife and I do as well. But certainly would love to come. In fact, Miss Judy was very gracious to, to invite me uh, late last year. We weren't able to make that happen. But please, would, would love to do that. And that, whether it's if you want us to come and present to your class, or even probably more importantly, is just to come and observe. You know, would certainly be, be happy to do that. This, this next question. Please, oh, oh, one second, Hillsborough is very lucky. He has three children at Hillsborough, and I have two grandchildren at Hillsborough. <laughs> so, you know, Hillsborough, you know, they, they have the opportunity to have five of our children right there at Hillsborough in one school, so that's very unusual. So, Hillsborough may get a little special attention. This next question isn't so friendly. Why are legislators so opposed to our rights to negotiate as a group rather than free agents? Why are you trying to take away all of our negotiating rights? Well, I'll take that because I did sponsor the bill um, <laughs> that, uh, that, that repealed the Negotiations Act. Um, it was very controversial, and I understand that, and had a lot of input from teachers, uh, some for and some opposed to uh, negotiations. Uh, at the end of the day, and, and many in this room will probably disagree, but I, I think I speak for the four of us, in that no one organization, I don't care who it is, no one organization should come between teachers and the school board. No one organization should have a singular voice to speak for all teachers, <coughs> especially when that organization might have 50% of teachers in a district that are even members. And, and what we tried to do, and, and I think we were successful, but I'm certainly open to any suggestions to any of the uh, uh, improvements that can be made uh, with the Collaborative Conferencing Act. At the end of the day, our school board here, the Franklin Special School Board and the Williamson County School Board, they are duly and constitutionally elected to set the policy for these two districts. And in the case of Williamson County School, which did have negotiations through collective bargaining, effectively, that organization has veto power over a duly and constitutionally elected body. And in other words, with certain policies, they cannot proceed unless the union uh, signs off on it. And, and fundamentally, uh, I, have, I have a disagreement with that, and, I, and the overwhelming majority of the, the General Assembly did, did as well. Uh, one thing that was very painful, uh, or disconcerting, I should say, is that some within the education profession felt like we were trying to stifle teachers' voices, that we didn't want teachers to be heard. And in fact, it's just the opposite, because when everything has to be filtered through a union, not every voice gets heard. And through collaborative conferencing, uh, now every teacher, every professional organization has an opportunity to have a voice and, and be heard. Um, and, and I think time will tell, and again, please, I mean this with all sincerity, if there are issues or problems with state policy with regards to how teachers are heard and how their voices are heard and, and their ideas contemplated by the school board, and if we need to make changes, I'm, I'm open to that, and, and I mean that with all my heart, and, and uh, uh, we, we may need to make changes along the way, and if we do, we will, uh, but it, it just, I think that the the proof and time had proven that, that, collab or that negotiations through one single union were not effective. We're, our time is running out, but I, I think I need to ask this question, and Ms. Barton, you may be able to. Where is the state in developing an evaluation model that better evaluates special education teachers in the role that they're actually doing? For example, IEP paperwork, deadlines for IEP, reevaluations, consultants with general education teachers, teaching strategies, accommodating, modi modifying curriculum. 
Um, so there's two components to this. There's the qualitative rubric that is used to assess teachers, and then there is the outcome measure. So special educators right now don't have um, individual value-added data. And uh, the, the truth is that across our state right now, there are so many models of what special education teachers are focusing on. Um, in some places, it is that list, the IP meetings, running the paperwork and such. But in many places, special education teachers are co-teaching right alongside general education teachers to make sure that the students in those classrooms are achieving. And so across the board, we know the focus of IDEA is to ensure that students who learn differently, are able to be supported in that journey, and uh, the score report that reviewed all of the teacher evaluation recommendations and our own department report did um, come out to say that we think that the value added results for students with um, IEPs should be part of how we assess our overall value added model. Right now that's precluded by law. Um, so I think we will see changes, we'll see developments to the rubric instrument over time. I think we'll see developments to the quantitative measure over time. Um, but I think we don't want to create a rubric that pigeonholes what special education teachers must be doing because it is such a varied position. And the last question, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, in trying to obtain a foreign language waiver, why are we instructed that we cannot use the fact that the student has an IEP and receives special education support? Um, I think it goes back to the fact that students who have IEPs learn differently. And as someone with people in my family in that situation, it, it, that we should support their learning journey in a different way does not mean that we should necessarily declare that all students with special, special learning needs have different expectations. So having an IEP alone shouldn't be a reason that we, we change the standard for academic achievement. Um, and it should be a factor that we look at in a broader waiver. Thank you. You noticed our time is out, and so we will not have any questions from the floor. But I remind you, if you have a burning question, please take a card, write it down, get it to Judy, and we'll try to get it to the appropriate person. Thank you very much. Thank really you. appreciate all of you coming. Thank you. Assistant Commissioner Barton and gentlemen, thank you, thank you for your time today, for your information, for giving us this opportunity to have this legislative link, creating communication, cooperation, and action. A donation to the Books from Birth Foundation will be made in honor of each of you for being here today. Um, very quickly, but very importantly, many people make this forum possible, and I want to recognize Mr. Steve Albrooks, who came in a little bit later after the meeting started from Congress of Marks Blackburn's office. Uh, I want to thank the MAC program at Liberty for letting us have their room tonight. The little, little ones were looking in to think, what are you doing in there? Um, to thank radio station WAKM and Charles Dibrell. We've, uh, Pat's already acknowledged our Franklin uh, High Honor Guard. Elaine Warwick, a very faithful uh, forum co-chair for many, many years, continues to help us. Bobby and Becca Vines came out of retirement to come back and do sound. Uh, all kinds of other things. Next year, when you might have a different address, I'm not, Kay's already said you have to fly back and do this. Um, Dr. Sandra Juarez, Peggy Bryant, Pat Tyree, Sarah Davis, Sharon Hurst, Sandy Jones, Ruth Wingfield, my very faithful former first grade team at Liberty and the dedicated faithful people here at Liberty in every capacity. Uh, Dr. Roby, Ms. Utterback, the custodians here who have been so faithful to, to do anything that we needed. Row chapter members who came tonight, uh, Franklin Williamson County educators, uh, administrators, uh, uh, representatives from the media, uh, Jacob Kelly, Lydia, uh, my husband, who's, who's heard and talked about this for quite a number of days, um, weeks, um, the Legislative Committee of Row Chapter, and to all of you, thank you for your commitment to education, and have a safe trip home. Thank you so much.